Okay. Okay, so we are going to present Stacksing, a Dropbox-like personal cloud for OpenStack Swift. So first of all, uh, to present ourselves, who are these crazy guys creating their own Dropbox? So, uh, okay, I'm, I'm Pedro Garcia, I'm a professor in, in a Spanish university, in the Universidad Rovira Virgili. And, uh, well, I'm also leading a research group on distributed system, and I am the coordinator of a European research project that is Cloud Spaces. The title is Open Service Platform for the Next Generation of Personal Clouds. It's a project, it's a three-year project. We are now just in the middle with six partners. We have three industrials, three academics. We have EPFL in Switzerland. We have Eurecom in France and Universidad Rovira Virgil in Spain. And then we have three industrial partners. We have TSAT, that is an infrastructure provider in Spain. We have uh, iOS, that is a software uh, solution provider in Spain. And we have NEC, that needs no presentation, is a, a global partner. So the, the two major challenges of this project is to create an open personal cloud, uh, uh, overcoming two main limitations, that is uh, privacy and interoperability, that I will explain uh, later on. So, Stacking this Dropbox for OpenStack has been created in the context of, of this research project. First of all, let's define what is a personal cloud because it's not a, a common term. So uh, we, we have a definition with three main services that each personal cloud should accomplish that are storage, synchronization, and sharing. So for us, a personal cloud should provide reliable, redundant, uh, scalable storage, that is cloud storage. It should offer file synchronization from heterogeneous devices, like desktop clients or, or mobile clients. And uh, last, it should provide sharing capabilities, so enabling users to share information with other users. Uh, the most well-known personal cloud that everybody of you know is, is Dropbox. So they are using cloud storage in Amazon S3, and they are offering synchronization from different devices and, and sharing capabilities. So our main motivations in this project are three. So we would like to create, first of all, an open, uh, an open source personal cloud. Uh, and we consider that in the market, we, there are a lot of proprietary solutions, but we don't find a good uh, solution for the cloud. So we stack seeing it's, of course, using OpenStack, that, that, that is the open source cloud, and OpenStack Swift, that is object storage. Another important pr problem that we find in existing systems, in existing personal clouds, is that users uh, lack control of their information. And we really want that users retake control of their data. So, uh, and then you need an open source uh, project to control your information. And then we are, we are also going to provide some interesting privacy features like client-side encryption or privacy-aware data sharing mechanisms in our infrastructure. And last, uh, the, the other problem is vendor locking. So most systems are closed. You can share with users in your system, but not with others. Uh, in our project, we, we will uh, bet on open APIs and interoperability so you can really exchange information and share information with other providers or other installations of, of Stacksing. So I will let now my, my core developers explain you the architecture of, of, of the system and, and the performance of, of Stacksing. So Christian, please. Thank you, Pedro. OK, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Chris Lancotes, as Pedro said, and I am one of the Staxing developers. Um, I'll start explaining you the big picture of our architecture, but to make it clear, I will try, I will explain it in three different stages, OK? So in the first one, um, we created this architecture that, like Dropbox, we separate uh, with a couple data flow from metadata flow. As you can see here in the picture, here there are the three main blocks of the architecture, which are the desktop client, the Staxing server, and OpenStack Swift. And as you can see, the desktop client uh, com communicates directly with OpenStack Swift in order to upload me 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 uh, data, sorry, and uh, directly with the Staxing server in order to upload metadata of the files. 
In a second stage, we put a, a RabbitMQ, which is a well-known message object middleware, to allow push notification to the clients in order to stay in sync. And we also develop an elastic sync protocol that we will explain in more detail later. So in the current stage, we um, created, uh, we develop an API as a Swift proxy module. So unlike the desktop client, uh, we've got a, our desktop client that uh, has to communicate with OpenStack Swift directly and with RabbitMQ in order to upload me metadata. Um, we've got the mobile clients that communicate directly with the StackSync API in order to interact with the architecture. Okay, now that you've got uh, um, the big picture more or less clear in your mind, I will explain what happens when a file is going to be synchronized. Um, so I'll start with the life cycle, and I, and later Adri Adrian and me will explain in more detail each block of the architecture. First of all, okay, let's suppose that a user creates a new um, file in our uh, synchronized folder. So the client will receive a notification from the operating system that, hey, you've got a new file here. You've got to do something. The first thing that we do is to obtain metadata from this file. Uh, for example, um, file name, uh, file size. So. Uh, the second step is to upload the data to OpenStack Swift directly. Once that this is done, uh, we uh, communicate with the StackSync server in, the, in order to give them the metadata of the files. And if everything is correct, the metadata is correct, the version of the file is correct, uh, we have to communicate the other clients that uh, a new file has been created by, by another user. So we use RabbitMQ to send to the other clients, the client two and client three, the metadata, and when they process and when they process the metadata, we'll download the file from OpenStack Swift. So this is the the life cycle that we've got when a new file is created or 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 not. Now um, I would like to explain what happened with the desktop client. So the desktop client, when receive a notification that there's a new file, uh, we've done. So we have to do some process here. Uh, so the main task of the desktop client is, uh, first of all, watch the file system. We have to be always watching the file system uh, to detect user uh, actions, for example, create, modify, or remove a file. And the second one, if the user creates a file, uh, we have to do the process that I told uh, uh, before. This process is first, split the um, file into small chunks, uh, compress them, and option, optionally encrypt them or not. Once that this process is uh, done, we upload the uh, chunks to the OpenStack Swift, all the chunks. Some of the features that the desktop client has is file versioning, file sharing between users, and OS integration. Uh, as OS integration, we understand uh, overlay icons and notification. As you can see in this picture, uh, we've got a synchronized folder, uh, and the green dots are uh, explaining us that, OK, everything is synchronized, everything is OK. And mm, this, part, this bubble of here is explaining us that uh, some file has been updated. After that, um, Adrian, uh, the other StackSync developer, will explain you in more detail what's happening with the StackSync server and the rest of the architecture. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Adrian. I, I am the, the other developer of, uh, of StackSync. And I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, the StackSync server and the rest of the components of our architecture. Uh, what we do with the, the StackSync server is to create a, a virtual file system on top of the data objects uh, on OpenStack Swift. Okay. So uh, the StackSync server offers many uh, operations to, to the clients. And uh, here we, we, displayed, uh, we display three, three of them that we consider to be the, the most important. Uh, the first one is the, the get account. Okay, and the uh, clients call this action in order to get uh, information about the, the user. And this information includes uh, information, for example, about uh, Swift, 
And this can be, for example, the, the, the username on Swift, uh, the storage URL, and the, and the information about Swift in order for them to uh, communicate directly to Swift, to upload and download uh, data objects from Swift. The second one is the get changes. Uh, we use this, uh, this action in order for clients to uh, keep uh, synchronized. Okay? So uh, when, we, when clients call this action, they get uh, the, the remote repository, the current state of the repository, and they retrieve this information, this metadata information, and, uh, and check that uh, they are uh, consistent with uh, their, their local repositories. If there, are any, if there, are, there is any uh, update, what they will do next, they will communicate with uh, OpenStack and download uh, the chunks that they need in order to uh, create the, the new file and uh, keep the, the system con consistent. And the third one, and the most common, the most common operation in our system is uh, the commit. And uh, this commit is called uh, every time uh, a client creates, modifies, or deletes a file. Okay? It sends the commit to the, to the server, the server processes the commit, everything is correct, and so on, and then uh, it, makes it makes it persistent into the, the, to the database. On the right, we have uh, an example of, uh, of a metadata in, a, in the JSON representation of the metadata. We can see the typical parameters of the, of the file. So as uh, many clients can uh, modify a file at the same time, the Saxon server may face some conflicting scenarios. Uh, he, in this case, for example, user one and user two, they modify the same file at the same time. And, the, and then they, they commit the, the changes to the, to the Saxon server. So what we do here is pretty simple. So the first, uh, the first version to be processed in the Saxon server is, uh, is considered to be the, the winning version. Okay? So in this case, let, let's say, uh, user one was the one that uh, was processed first. So he, he gets an acknowledgment. So he gets, okay, everything is correct. You are synchronized, you are okay. And then the user two receives, receives a conflict message saying, okay, here we have a problem here. So what, what the user two will do next, he will uh, get the metadata from the Staxin server and uh, get the new file, the file that, that won, the user one file. And with his uh, conflicted copy, he will create another file and treat it as a new file and upload it again to, to the, to the server, to our server. So uh, the workspace is a very important uh, concept in our architecture. It represents the, the relation between files and, and users. And uh, every time that a new user is created, uh, a new workspace is assigned to, to this user. Okay? By default, every, a user has one workspace. Uh, and this, on this workspace, he will store all his files. Okay, so now let's say that uh, user one and user two are to share a folder. So every folder that is shared, uh, it, it reflects on a new workspace. So this shared workspace will hold files that are shared by user one and user two. And as you may have noticed, uh, workspaces have uh, some similarity to Swift containers. So yes, uh, workspaces are mapped into uh, a Swift container. And they both have the same permissions, okay? both logical in the workspace and physical on the container. Uh, we, can, uh, we have different encryption set settings for workspaces. Uh, we can uh, store files in plain, we can, we can set the server side or client side encryption. So uh, let's say that we are going to uh, store it in plain. So then um, the file won't get encrypted. Okay, it will travel, it will travel plain and it, it will be stored plain. So the other scenario, server side, uh, let's say we upload a file using a secure channel, like, like HTTPS, for example, and then it gets to the cloud provider, and the cloud provider, uh, with his key, he will uh, encrypt the file. Okay, but he will, he, he will be able to access to this file later on as he is the, the owner of the, of the key. And on the last setting, we have the client side. 
In this case, uh, clients encrypt the files before uploading them to the, to the cloud so that uh, only, only they know the, the, the key and are able to encrypt and decrypt the files. And not even the cloud provider is able to, to see what's going on. So we have uh, some important concepts of uh, our architecture that, that reflect uh, directly to OpenStack Swift. Uh, the first one is uh, that every Staxing installation is reflected, reflected into, into a tenant, okay? So that uh, every user in a Staxing installation goes to one uh, storage URL in Swift. Next one is a user, which uh, a user in Staxing is a user in Swift. No problem with that. Uh, the third one is the workspace. A logical workspace is a physical container. Then we need an administrator in Staxing that will be uh, a user with admin rights on the tenant, on the Staxing tenant. Okay? And th this is, we need this because we have to create users on that tenant. We need to delete them. We need to create uh, containers. And we need to uh, set permissions to these containers in order to allow the right people in. And uh, finally, there is a file. A logical file, metadata, is reflected into uh, small pieces, as Christian said, that are called chunks. Okay? And we store these chunks uh, as a data objects in, in Swift. So let's say uh, a user, user one, wants to, to share a folder with user two. So what he will do first, he will create a, a share proposal. Uh, he will send it to the Staxing server, and then the Staxing server will notify the address, the user two. After that, user two accepts or denies the, the proposal, and uh, the server, using the, the administrator, the, the tenant, the user with uh, rights on, the, on this tenant, will create a container and set up the, ICL, the ICLs in order uh, to, to let the right people in, right? Using the the container read and container write uh, tags. So we use uh, RabbitMQ as a message broker. Uh, you all know uh, RabbitMQ. And uh, we, use, we use it in order to allow communication between clients and servers. OK? So uh, RabbitMQ provides us with uh, some benefits. And uh, one of some of them are listed here. For example, uh, it allows us to get push notifications so that clients are not constantly uh, sending requests, pulling the, the server, so that every time there is a change, a message is sent directly to the, to the client. It also allows us to, to balance the load, okay, to share out the load uh, between the different uh, server instances that, that we may have in the server. And it also, we have another benefit, which is uh, sending multicast messages, so that sending only one message, we can reach uh, all interested clients. In this picture, we can, see, we can see it better. On the right, we have uh, three clients. Each client has its own queue. And uh, we have on the top uh, the server queue. Uh, and clients will always send messages to that queue. Okay? And the Staxing server will uh, consume and consume messages from that queue. So as our sequentially. But as our, uh, as our system is uh, stateless, we can add more uh, instances of our Staxing server so that uh, it, can, it can adapt to the demand. Uh, and it can, it, it can cope with the, with the load. And we can also he, see here that uh, user 3 is not sharing anything. It has its own uh, workspace, and that's it. But user one, uh, client 1 and client 2 are sharing a folder, and they are interested in receiving messages from workspace 1. So every message that is sent to workspace 1, it gets uh, multicast to the queues of uh, client 1 and client 2. So now we have seen how uh, desktop clients communicate. They uh, synchronize and so on. 
And now we are going to see uh, how mobile and web clients are able to access the information on the stack scene. So what we've done is to create an API. This API lives uh, in the proxies pipeline alongside with uh, Keystone, uh, logging, caching, uh, and so on, and any other middleware that, that we may have uh, on our pipeline. Um, and it communicates with uh, the taxing server in order to get metadata and authorization. Uh, one thing that is very important to point out is that uh, our API only activates when the, an unspecific header is set, which is this X Staxing API. Otherwise, it won't interfere uh, whatsoever with uh, a normal request to, to Swift. And uh, before that uh, API, we have uh, another module, which is an authenticator, that uh, it's an OAuth 1.0 implementation. And uh, what it does is it's, it gets the all OAuth parameters, like uh, access token, uh, the timestamp, signature, and so on. And it gets, uh, communicates with the Saxon server. It gets the user information, user ID, and some other uh, important information, and sets it to the, adds it to the YSG environment so, so that later on, our API is able to get this user and uh, retrieve files knowing that uh, the user is correct. So here we have a, a figure uh, explaining uh, what I said before. We have, on the bottom, we have the OpenStack Swift with the, with the pipeline and the proxy. And on the top, we have our stack scene with the metadata database uh, and the mobile client on the left. So let's say that the client is to, to make a request to our API. Okay, so he sets, he, he wants to get a file, a specific file, and he sets the, our, our header, Staxing API. So the, the request goes through the pipeline, and when it gets to our auth, authentication plugin, it communicates with, uh, with the server, it gets the user, the correct user, okay, it's authenticated, and then it goes to the API. And knowing that the user is correct, the API will get the metadata, and, uh, he will, and the API will check that the user has permissions on that file. After that, the API will get the, will get the, the data objects and return the, the, the file to the, to the mobile clients. So now that we have seen the, the architecture, we have an overview, uh, Christian will, uh, will explain to you a little bit more about uh, performance. And uh, we have done some tests that will be explained by Christian. Well, um, now you've got a clear, a clear picture that, uh, of our architecture, but uh, where is Staxing among the rest of personal clouds? Um, to answer this question, we do some benchmark to our platform, to our clients. And well, this is one of the first graphs that I want to show you. This is the traffic overhead. Uh, uh, that we capture from the uh, personal clouds that we uh, test, and uh, executing just a trace, uh, creating files, modifying files, and, and deleting files. As you can see, we are the blue ones that we are uh, mm, capturing about, we are transferring about 570 me megabytes, which is not bad, as you can see. And surprisingly, the, the surprise, surprisingly, Dropbox exhibits uh, the highest uh, traffic overhead. Another one is uh, we wanted to compare uh, push uh, versus pull. Uh, to create this benchmark, we decided to compare uh, Staxing with Dropbox, which is another open source personal cloud that is using a web DAP protocol in order to uh, stay in sync. So uh, as you can see, uh, we captured the kilobytes per minute uh, of metadata captur captured uh, during the test. And as you can see here, a Dropbox uh, is getting a high uh, bandwidth consumption, uh, not like uh, Staxing, oh, sorry, not like uh, Staxing, uh, that we are getting about uh, 20 kilobytes per minute approximately. The last one that I want to show you is the uh, server elasticity. So to create this benchmark, um, we use a, a trace. And as you can see, the gray part is the number of the instances, and the red line is the number of requests uh, that we uh, have. 
And as you can see, when the number of, requ the, of requests uh, go high, the number of instances increase, and when the number of uh, requests decrease, the number of uh, instances also decrease. So that's all. Uh, I hope that the I think that the question is answered. So now I'll leave you with Pedro to explain the last part of the presentation. Okay, so I finished now explaining you when, how to use or when to use stacking. Uh, they explain the architecture and the performance of the system. So first of all, I, I want, really want to stress and to outline that we are not presenting some early release or alpha release with a prototype. I mean, this is a stable release with thousands of lines of code, with extensive testing, book fiction, and usage by real users. So it can be really used out of the box right now, and we are going to continue on this. So it is a stable pro product after two years of development, so it's, it's stable. We didn't want to, to come here with, with a prototype. Uh, OK, so where can you use stack, Stacksing? So there are three main deployment scenarios. You have private clouds, hybrid clouds, and public clouds. So in the first one, uh, you have your OpenSwift installation. You install the Stacksing server, and then you control your data, and your users will be able to access your information and synchronize from different uh, devices and share information. A second one is a hybrid one. You prefer to have the metadata server, the Stacksing server, on your own organization, but delegate the data handling and Swift to a public provider. You can do that. And the third one could be you are a public uh, infrastructure provider. You want to offer this to your clients. You already are expert in OpenStack. Then install a Stacksing server. And now you will be able to have a, a personal cloud that you can offer to your clients. So uh, there are. Uh, current deployments now that, they, that have, are being in use with real clients. We have one private uh, cluster in our university with, that has been tested in the last months by students and professors. Uh, this would be this example of a private cloud cluster. Uh, then we have TSAT, is one of the partners of the project that has a tier four data center in Spain. And they are beginning to offer stacks in the, in the past months, they are entering clients and they are beginning to offer this to public organizations because the security of the, of the tool is, is very interesting for people with sensitive information. And finally, we have uh, Rediris, that is the Spanish uh, university network. They are beginning to offer Staxing as a service to the different universities and encourage them to adopt Staxing. So there is some now discussion because some ones want to use some cloud, others Staxing, and there is a discussion there in the network. But Rediris is betting on, on, on the Staxing solution. So OK. Uh, we really are open to the community. This is an open source project that you can modify, you can use, you can do whatever you want. We will give you all the support to this thing. We already have a community of, of, of people and companies interested in this thing. We have now clients available for Windows, for Linux, for Android. We have some web clients. Uh, there is a lot of documentation available at stacksing.org. So uh, how to deploy on top of Swift, uh, about the architecture. It's really modular and extensible. Everything, if you want to modify chunking, storage, the duplication, encryption, everything is modular. And it's easy to change. And it's easy to, for, to, to deploy for Swifter. So here I don't have to explain why you should use open store, uh, object storage and open stack Swift. But for many universities and places, they have to evangelize about that because they say, no, I install on cloud. It's a single web server, and you have the system running. And then I have to say, OK, but with object storage, you have redundant storage, and it's scalable. You can cope with demand. It's different. So I don't have to explain this to you. You know what is OpenStack Swift. And then if you already know how to install Swift, this is the harder part of the installation. Then installing Stacksing is, is easier. So my conclusion here is, is OK, Stacksing is a ready-to-use personal uh, cloud for OpenStack Swift. 
you can really use it now. Uh, and we are going to continue for the next two years working on that, apart from the people that want to contribute. What is next? We are going to incorporate more advanced privacy features. So now we are now offering client-side encryption for desktop clients, not for mobile clients. In the next months, we will offer that in, in, in mobile clients. And we will offer interesting privacy-aware sharing me mechanisms to share information in a secure way in groups. Interoperability, we are going to offer APIs to share information between different stacks in installations. For example, the university network in Spain, they were very interested in different universities creating a federation and, com and sharing information between them. And even because we have NEC on board, NEC will push these APIs so you can also communicate with uh, proprietary protocols that implement these APIs that are open, simple, and based on OAuth. Um, well, finally, we are going to provide more clients. So we are already working on, on an iOS and Mac uh, desktop clients. So it will be available in, in the next months. And as I said, it, it is open source. Uh, it is available in stacksin.org in, in GitHub. It's all the code. Uh, we have open benchmarks. So this, this test that Christian showed, we did not embed in these benchmarks. So we use ones for our researchers in Holland. And we uh, tested them. and we. We have the public traces of how we validate the system. Uh, we are really open to collaboration, so please uh, use the system and contribute to it. And thank you for your attention. Question? 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 Questions? Uh, I noticed that you guys are using either Postgres or MySQL for your metadata yeah. database. We are using uh, Postgres. Postgres. Yeah, yeah. Right now we are using Postgres, but uh, we can. Uh, we have a data abstraction object, so we can, uh, in fact, use whatever relational database uh, available. For example, MySQL or Postgres or wh whatever. The, you, and it's you, also extensible, so uh, anybody can go and uh, make an adapter for a key value store, for example, or whatever is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was curious how many foreign keys and that kind of database SQL features you have tied to before. A key value store is a, obviously a good well, yeah. idea for that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, like one, one little thing more. Dropbox also is using MySQL. So we, we in the beginning we used a key value store, but then you have a problem with consistency. So it's much easier to go for a relational one. And Dropbox is also going for MySQL, and it's well, just like that. <laughs> thank you. On your uh, mobile API slide, you guys uh, had website, but then throughout the, the rest, you didn't show much with a website. Do you have a website, kind of like OwnCloud has a website, where users can access that from a mobile browser or from mobile? Yeah. Yeah, we have a, a website. Well, what uh, what we did was uh, make a branch of the of the uh, OwnCloud uh, website, and we connected with our with our system. But uh, in parallel, we are working on a standalone uh, website uh, created uh, for for us. Okay, but uh, for the meanwhile, we have uh, the the adaption of the the OwnCloud one. Yeah, and I would like to add, we have the SoundCloud version. We have another p version in Python offering you all the web interface like Dropbox. But also, we have one partner in the consortium that is iOS with a web desktop. It's a virtual web desktop. And they already published a connection with the Staxing. And they, have, they are our Google Docs. So they have op Office in web and everything there. And they are offering that also as open source. So you can also download iOS as, as the web client, because they are using the APIs. So it's like, yeah, we are, there are different web layers. I think I have a question in the similar direction uh, concerning the problem of managing the data without having a client that has enough space for all the repositories. So the one question would be, is it possible to uh, synchronize certain folders selectively, uh, different on each client? And second one, can I maybe manage on the meta, metadata level without downloading all of uh, the files first? For the first question, ah, yeah. uh, we, right now we don't have this feature. We cannot uh, get, get uh, selective uh, synchronization. So we synchronize the whole repository. But uh, it's on our roadmap. 
and yeah, we we are <laughs> we already thought about that. Yeah, it's a feature that we want to add. Uh, for the second one, do you? Uh, well, the second one I thought that you asked uh, if it, it was possible to download metadata without data. Is it possible? Uh, the question is, I mean, let's say I want to reorganize my data, but on my client I don't have uh, space for all of that data. Let's say we have 20 gigabytes of pictures and I want ah. to reshuffle them. And one way I think would be go via a web page because then I can do it in a browser and don't have to download yeah, it. it. But another possibility, yeah, the question is what else is possible or is that a possibility? Well, right now, uh, as the clients synchronize, so they, they have to download all the, the content, so you would have to download everything. But uh, what you can do is you can go to the website and then you have uh, the list of your files and folders, you can rename them, you can move them uh, from one folder to another and so on. So I think if you have uh, a lot of uh, space, a lot of uh, storage, a lot of uh, files, the best way is to, to go through the, through the website or the API. You can, for example, go through the mobile clients, and you can also move a file in, into a folder and so on. Okay. On mobile networks, you have the problem with the, the um, cloud or the mobile network being inconsistent. Um, I know that obviously in your API, you chunk the data, you encrypt it, you send it. What happens if you've sent a partial of a file or you've received partial of a file, you've sent the metadata and then your connection, are you able to resume that? Are you able to ensure that other clients aren't downloading because they see the metadata but an incomplete file send? How do you recover? I want to say. Uh, well, in this case, what we've always done is first upload data, and once that all the data is uploaded, is in OpenStack Swift ready for all the clients. We then upload uh, the, the other part, which is metadata. The, and uh, once that metadata is updated, all the clients receive them, and then start the download part from the from Swift. So. Uh, so that's great. But what if during a um, large upload or a large download? Um, so great, the metadata is not there, but you're interrupted. Are you? Does the API have some sort of resume ah, well, ability? Well, mm, because n not in the APIs. I will explain from the desktop point of view. Uh, if you're trying to upload upload a file and uh, something happens, uh, the file remains unsync. So uh, the client start trying to upload the rest of the file, and once that the file is uploaded, uh, he will say, "Okay, this file is synchronized, and then I have to upload me metadata." So uh, we don't allow uh, this situation, this strange situation. So once that the client is really sure that all the data is ready, uh, then uh, he it changes to the second step. No, and the good thing of our architecture, for example, other systems like on cloud, they store the entire file. So if it's a large file, you have problems if you, uh, if you lose the connection or there is some problems. In our case, working with chunks, you resume the connection, then you have problems that you are not losing anything in either uploading or downloading. So it's, it's different. Yeah. You don't start from, from the beginning. You start from when, where you left. Yeah, okay, of course. Great. You can yeah. start you, from the chunk, or chunks that were not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, re, the remaining course. ones, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. own cloud, you get to restart, right? Yeah. Entirely. Yeah. yeah, you have to put everything in again. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the uh, authentication with Keystone uh, with the users and users in Swift, and I was kind of curious how that uh, works with an existing uh, OpenStack implementation where uh, the users are typical users of uh, application developers and not necessarily users of the applications themselves. <laughs> so. Uh... What we do in order to, for the client, the desktop client to, to authenticate, uh, we use Keystone, okay? We use Keystone users and uh, the password and so on. But for the, for the APIs, we use our uh, implementation of, uh, of OAuth. And, uh, it, so you, you have to, in the end, you have to log in in, in Keystone. 
And uh, every time you, ac you want to access to, to the, to the da data objects, you have to provide your credentials, your token in, in Keystone. Yeah, but you're, you're right. I mean, in our case, we map users of the system to users yeah. of Swift yeah. and containers to users. So it's, this is one design decision. We have another candidate model to bringing all users in a logical way to one single container. But for the moment, we decided to map this because it's simpler. For example, quotas in Swift can be applied to quotas in the container of the user and, and all the rest. Yeah. So are you looking at possible alternatives down the road so that uh, uh, you, you yeah have, like, yeah logical division yeah okay good thank, thank you Thanks. well I think that's all yeah yeah I think we are finishing now okay so, so thank you very much thank you thank you